Hi, and welcome back to SallyHughesBeauty.com um, to our In the Bathroom series. I'm really excited about this one because we've never done anything around this particular area of beauty before. Um, I'm with Morag Ross, who is um, one of the top film makeup artists in the world and has won three BAFTAs for it. Uh, she designed and did the makeup for films like The Aviator and Sense and Sensibility and Carol more recently, that kind of very beautiful makeup that's been seen everywhere of late. Um, she's worked with Kate Blanchett and Tilda Swinton and Sarah Jessica Parker and God, so many people, Jake Gyllenhaal and Jude Law, so many actors and actresses yeah. and kind of, it's easier to say who you haven't. Um, and I came across Morag because my friend Mary Greenwell um, was posting about her and saying how amazingly brilliant she was because Mary obviously works a lot with Kate Blanchett on the red carpet and Morag always works with Kate Blanchett on celluloid. So um, that's how I came across Morag and the more I looked at her wor work, the more wowed I was by it. So I thought we'd have a bit of a film makeup bathroom session because mm -hmm. I think lots of people want to know more about it and I think there are so many fashion and session makeup artists on Instagram and Twitter and TV and stuff that we mm. forget about this quite different form yeah. of makeup artistry. So how, Morag, did you get involved? You went straight into film and TV, didn't you? I went straight into film. I mean, I started off at art college. Yeah. So, so I got, actually studying. got into makeup at art college. Um, I was studying mural design in Glasgow mm -hmm. and um, we used to have a fashion show every year and that was actually where I started um, doing makeup just as, you know, to help out. And I got really into it and I got into, um, I liked it and it was the time of punk and everything and new romantics. And so I wore a lot of makeup myself. Mm -hmm. And um, Were you a punk? Well, I was there sort of late 70s, so it was just the tail, it was more commercial punk, mm -hmm. you know. So it was more wearable, I mm -hmm. guess. But then I got into the new romantic thing. So I wore a lot of, you know, I used to come down to Blitz, you know, we made the pilgrimage. I used to help out with hairdressers in Glasgow for free. I always had a really great haircut while I was at art college and, you know, would do makeup for their photographs. Or right. Whatever. So I would, you know, even, and Betty Riley would, was around. Um, so it was a really good time just to start. And somebody said to me, you know, you could do makeup for a living. I'd never thought about it. Mm -hmm. And they said, you should try applying to the BBC. And I did. Uh, and just coincidentally, you know, because the schools used to come up and at the time it was really good because it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. You didn't have to pay. It was, a, it was actually a paid job, even at a trainee's rate. And um, you had to go down and, you know, I got an interview and you did a test, which was really scary. And then you had this, when you got in, you know, they did a three month course. And I was really lucky because the year that I applied, they actually wanted to try out art students. They oh, used to, interesting. They used to try different kinds of people to yeah. see who made the best mm -hmm. makeup artists, mm -hmm. you know. And that year, we heard afterwards, they decided to try arty people. So it was a school of 12 and I think 10 of us came from art college. Oh, interesting. So, so can good. you remember what your test was? Can you remember what you had to do to get in? Yeah, you had to do three things. You had to um, do what they called, but what we didn't really know, the terminology, was a straight makeup, like you would do for a newsreader or a presenter, uh -huh. what you thought was appropriate. And you had to put on it, you had to attach a hairpiece. Okay. And you had to do an aging makeup. So, God, that, I mean, that's quite <laughs> overwhelming, I think. Lots yeah. of people with an interest in beauty could do the first and mm -hmm. maybe do the second, but yeah. ageing makeup, most people wouldn't know where to yeah. start. What did you do? Well, you know, we didn't, but they did say, you know, try not to worry about it, just just see what you come up with, you mm -hmm. know, what do you think about the face? So, actually, I remember I did it. I, I did it, I think, with one colour. I think I used a grey powder mm -hmm. eyeshadow. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of painted in the nose to mouth lines mm -hmm. and, you know, bags under the crow's feet and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I think that's what I did. And um, the hair piece, I put so many pins in, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something is so that it wouldn't come off. Yeah. I just remember putting loads of hair pins in. And, and the straight makeup, I was quite, you know, yeah. I just did a nice straight makeup with yeah. a bit of eyeliner. So you did that course and then did that kind of. Did you stay in TV for a while or did you I then did. move? I stayed in TV. I think people would say it was the minimum amount of time I stayed. I I thought it was an amazing training. You know, we did a bit of everything. 
we did we worked on film because BBC, you know, they did be- really they do really beautiful period productions and we were very famous for it at the time. Um, so you know, the system was that you were you worked with a designer, you worked with different designers, you were allocated different programs and uh, you would get your schedule for the week. So you would either be on a, a series, maybe you'd be allocated on that for three months or whatever, or you would you would be doing things like the news, the weather, the weatherman, um, outside broadcasts at the Royal Albert Hall or something. So it really was varied and um, you did learn to, to cope with a lot of different things really and a lot of different people. I always think that the, um, that it's quite different, I mean it's obviously different in a million ways being TV versus fashion, but I think one of the key differences is that TV makeup artists have to make up normal people's faces, mm-hmm. in that fashion makeup yeah. artists tend yeah. to just make up really beautiful people yeah. all the time, mm. um, which I'm not saying isn't without challenges in other ways, but yeah. it's quite an unreal world to always be faced with a gorgeous model of 20-odd, yeah. whereas TV makeup artists, as you say, might be a weatherman, it might be mm-hmm. somebody who's come in to be interviewed on the news or whatever. Yeah. But, or, or also, you know, um, it's the whole character thing, yeah. because... Film makeup isn't always about beauty, yes. you know, and I find I find it quite hard now, you know, because I've worked with Kate Blanchett a lot, and she's so beautiful. Yeah, she's so beautiful on the red carpet. You yeah, know, and, and Mary does an amazing job, um, and I really love it. And but she's so different for each role, and she really is fearless about inhabiting it. Yeah. But I struggle with myself because I find myself wanting to make her beautiful and, yeah. and wanting but her that's to think. Isn't yeah, it? Even though I know yeah. her, I still want her to believe that I can make her look beautiful. But a lot of the time, I, you know, I'm not supposed I to. Suppose I suppose something like Carol I'm is a to. gift, isn't it? Yes. Because Carol, it's so yeah. gorgeous. And she so then you get so a job gorgeous. like that, and it's yeah. like, oh my God, it's yeah. just really good. I mean, it's great fun in a different way. Mm. Um, but I think also in just in the sort of climate that we are now with the internet and everything, um, something like Carol is, is just going to be so popular mm. because there are so many young people wanting to be makeup artists and aspiring to sort of that kind of clean look and they're really into lipstick colours and everything. Yeah, if, you do, if you're asked to make lips, someone to look really natural or to make them look ill or old, they're not going to say, oh, yeah. <laughs> please tell me what you use. So would I be right in saying, although that um, television is great training, you were a bit frustrated and wanting to do more? It's not that I was frustrated. I think at the time, because it was, you know, I've done this for about 30 years. At the time, you know, I was out of art school and I, I can look back on it and think, oh, I was so young. I, you know, we had to wear overalls, blue and white striped overalls, wow. which I really hated. And we were the only department in the BBC who wore overalls. And we did actually start a kind of movement against it. You know, there were a lot of meetings because we didn't want to wear, we didn't want to be um, associated, you know, is, you know, recognisable by that when nobody else was. Yeah. But um, so we had to wear the overalls. And, it, you know, the BBC is a really fantastic institution. And I had come from art school and I did sort of rail against that a little bit. Yeah. And so I stayed for about three and a half years. Okay. Which is not a long time. I would, was in those days, if you've been doing this for 30 years, in those days was there a fair bit of um, sexism about women who were doing makeup as though they, they might be doing a kind of lesser job? Because even now, mm. sometimes people talk to me as though I'm a little bit stupid because one of the things I write about is beauty, yeah. so I must be a bit thick, mm-hmm. whereas a man can write about football or whatever, yeah. and he's not. Did 30 years ago, that must have been more pronounced, that kind of stereotype. It was, but you know what? I mean, don't get me started, because, you know, it is still like that. I'm, yeah, in film, quite often, even within the structure of a film crew, there's a preconceived idea of what we're capable of. Mm-hmm. And I always think of myself as a technician, Yeah. and I like that label. Yeah. You know, I'm a technician, I've got a skill, it's a craft, but there's all the connotations again of beauty and it's a girl of, thing. Yes, cosmetics and makeup, mm. um, and it, it is a it's an absolute craft from mm. you know editorial you know what doesn't matter what it is still it's a skill with it's an artistry, you know. of course. So yeah, it gets on Yeah, I think most people, if they wanted, even if they were already in the beauty industry or makeup industry, um, and wanted to move into films, I don't think anybody 
would know where to start. It feels like such a closed industry when you're on the outside of it. It feels such mm. like such a kind of bedded in community. So yeah. how did you make that leap? Well, you know, it was just that thing about I was lucky because I went to the BBC. I stayed there for about mm, three years and a friend of mine had left. It was just about the time, it was in the mid 80s. So it was just about the time when Channel 4 had just started right. up. Pop videos were just all starting and it was all little companies, very young people. And a friend of mine was doing this series with a, pu um, a busking band from Brighton called <laughs> Cookie Snackenberger. Right. And it was like a spoof show. Really, really creative. They were great people. And it was like two weeks on, two weeks on. She said, why don't you, we do it together? Mm -hmm. Why don't you just leave? Mm -hmm. We'll do it together. And so I just thought, okay. So I left. And so I, we did this job two weeks. And then in the two weeks that was downtime, I kind of hunted around for other things. Mm -hmm. And I did a few, everything. It was just such a brilliant time. Everything just spiraled in. I did a few pop videos. Then I did a little short film. And it, it was just, you know, it was one of those things. It was a really fortunate time. Can you remember, because at, at this point, you're not presumably at the level where you're designing a makeup no. look for a film, yeah. but, but you're a technician, you're a makeup artist yeah. on mm. films and videos or whatever. Can, was there a turning point? Was there a certain film that came along where you thought, shit got real, this feels mm. like a big and important yeah. milestone for me? Well, the first film, I did a short film, um, so all the time, you know, I, I was getting more confidence about yeah. it. And I was, I did have that confidence of youth. Can yeah. you call it, call it yeah, ar arrogance that. as well? Yeah. yeah. Which I don't have now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, the less you know, you know, the less it's going to scare you, really. And um, I did a short film with, I think it was with, yeah, it was with, they were called Aldabra. It was Sarah Radcliffe mm -hmm. and Tim Bevan. I think. And they did this short film called The Man Who Shot Christmas. And then they were going to do this film with Derek Jarman, the mm. late Derek Jarman. Mm -hmm. And it was about the, the life of Caravaggio. Mm -hmm. So again, it was a much, much smaller industry even then. So they just thought, oh great, well more I did, you know, The Man Who Shot Christmas. Mm -hmm. Why don't we ask her if she wants to do Caravaggio? And they called I me and said, that film. Do, you want me, do you want to do this film called Caravaggio? And of course I had been at art college and I, I knew about Derek. And I knew about Caravaggio, and I just thought, this is it's a bit of a dream gig, isn't it? It was As dream. An art it student. absolutely was. Yeah. And I remember I went along to his flat in above the Shaftesbury Theatre. He had a studio flat. He was such a lovely man. And he kind of, you know, he showed me the, the books and he said, Well, this is how it's going to look. Um, this is what I want. And he said, You know, I, he said, I would like a lot of them, you know, I'd like a lot of the characters to have gold teeth. He said, and I've been wondering, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. And he had this great idea. And he said, I've been trying things out, so this is what I want to do. And he got, I think he got some nail polish mm -hmm. and he had gold leaf. And he started showing me how to do it. Wow. And he just painted this gold leaf on his teeth, which is exactly, that's what I did. I mean, you know, wow. we didn't, I didn't use nail polish. I used um, spirit gum. But, you know, it wasn't a big budget film. I had never, it didn't occur to me to think, go to a dental technician and have gold caps made. And anyway, yeah. we didn't have the money and so many people had to have these gold teeth. So that was what we did. But anyway, I'm backtracking. I'm going ahead of myself. Um, I got that film and it was my first film as a designer. Mm -hmm. And So did you have a little team of makeup artists? It was myself and, you know, another friend of mine who had been at the BBC. Uh, we did makeup and hair. Her, her name is Mary Ben Shlomo. She's one of my great friends. We did makeup and hair together. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Sandy Powell, it was yeah. her first film. Wow. Uh, and it was just, it was really nice because it was all kind of young. We were all young and we were all at um, ex art school. And Derek was just, he loved it like that. And he was just very nurturing. So it wasn't scary. It was just, he was just lovely. And also, he a, how great that your first um, film in charge of yes, the overall first film experience was, was a so good. Film that really was all about aesthetics. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really rich, wasn't it? And you know, it was, it was really rich, and it was an artist. Yeah, and, yeah, it was recreating paintings yeah. most of the time. So yeah. it was like sort of art college had sort of merged yeah. with this thing that I had started you really to work ask in. For yeah. more, I suppose. It was amazing. Way. And what was your first sort of commercial? Because that's an art film. That's an art yeah. house film. And mm. um, is that very different from the experience of doing? I mean, there you are in this little group of art students who've moved into the industry and you're kind of collaborating and creating something. That mm. must be quite different from turning up, 
I said bloody Scorsese film that's yeah. got, you know, so yeah. much riding on it. Mm-hmm. So many famous people, so many people at the absolute top level of their experience and game yeah. across the crew mm-hmm. and technicians and so on. Are you more scared? Do you still get scared going into those sorts of projects? Um, I do, yeah. I think I get more I scared. I, I th- no, but I think I get more scared now. That's what I was saying yeah. when I was young. And it's, I think it's partly to do with age. I, I don't know if... It's, yeah, I don't... Chutzpah that you have when mm. you're young really can propel you to go yeah, I think that's to, true. to great destinations. <laughs> you know, the bigger the film and, you know, the bigger the budget, the, the more people have an opinion and yeah. you have to please more people and... Um, so the pressure is just greater. It gets, it just gets, it does get scarier. Also, I just think, I, I think at the beginning of every film, I also, th- I just think, I don't know anything. Yeah. I mean, okay. Well, that's really interesting because I think that everybody feels a bit of an imposter in their job. Yeah. I absolutely. I always say I'm going to get found out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. So do you go into a film and think I don't know why they mm-hmm. hired me, mm-hmm. even though you've got a shelf full of BAFTAs and this yeah. amazing CV, mm-hmm. you're thinking I don't know what I'm yeah. doing. What is that? Uh, yeah, what is it? I, I don't know. It's, it's partly a female thing, but lots of men feel it too, I think. And maybe it's good for you. You know, maybe mm. you have to keep yeah. proving yourself every day. Yeah. Maybe it's good for your sort of mental health and work mm. ethic to think you're not quite good enough. Yeah. But I think you could probably give yourself a break, given your, the, what you've done. No, I, I think it's fear of the unknown. I think that's what normalises it, because... You know, in any um, aspect of makeup, you're you're starting afresh, aren't you? You're yeah. Not doing new so faces. I think yeah, new faces, new expectations. I think maybe getting older, you know more things that c- can go wrong. Yeah, yeah. And that's what you don't have blind faith yes. that everything will be fine. Yeah. I suppose. And and you know, I suppose it, yeah. Other people, <clears throat> you work with bigger egos, maybe. As yeah. Well. So you you know, it's all about balance, isn't it? Yeah. If we think about a kind of popcorn movie, say, you know, right. some kind of big budget thing, where does it start? Do you have preliminary meetings before you get the job or do you just get the job, then start the meeting process and the design? How does your work process go? Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, that's a good one. Because I don't go into a job, um, I know costume people who will go in with like, mood boards and things to explain their possible work process, mm-hmm. you know, at the interview stage. I don't usually do that. Sometimes I'll go in. I haven't done that very often, actually. Um, sometimes I'll go in with books um, as a sort of idea, you know, of what I think, you know, could What's be What's happened at this point? Have you seen the script? Yeah, yeah, right. read the so script. You've been yeah. sent the script. Exactly. Have you seen a storyboard or anything? Or? No. You no. Would just You would get the script and then go in and meet the director or talk to the director. Okay. Directly. The director. The director. Not his people. Not his people. No. Okay. You, would meet, you would meet the director and... It would either just be the director or director and producer. Sometimes producers want to sit in. So you have sat across the table from Martin Scorsese and said, hi, this is what I would do. Do you know what? My, I will tell you, Martin Scorsese, I didn't actually meet him face to face to get that job. That's, I, um, they were going to shoot The Aviator and uh, Kay asked me to look after her, to do personal <laughs> makeup, mm-hmm. not to be the makeup designer. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, great, love to do it. Mm-hmm. And then, I think, a day later, I got a call from Sandy Powell, mm-hmm. and she said... So Sandy Powell is like the most famous costume designer. She's a legend. The, she's in, like a proper legend and has Earth. won loads of yeah. Oscars. And if she's nominated for an Oscar, you pretty much know she's always going to win. Yeah. So that's who Sandy and Powell And she's only nominated for two Oscars this yeah. year, and two BAFTAs. Yeah, and, we'll, and just seems to win <laughs> all the time, um, because she's amazing. So yeah. yes, go back. So Sandy, because we've worked together a lot over the years... She calls me up the next day and she said, listen, I heard that, you know, Kate asked you if you were going to do her. And I said, yeah, it's great. And she said, well, I want you to do the whole thing. She said, I I really, you know, she said, I really feel strongly about how, especially about how the women, the rest of the women, female cast will look. And the period looks, why don't, you know, couldn't you do the whole thing? I'm going to suggest it. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. So she put it forward to the producers and to Marty. And they said yes. So then I was going to do the whole thing. And um, so I hadn't actually met Marty because it was shot in Montreal and mm-hmm. LA. So I went to Montreal, still, still didn't, hadn't met him. And um, 
So I started my prep work, which was in Montreal, and I remember the day, you know, I had to go and meet Marty. And, you know, you got a slot to meet Marty. So, you know, his assistant would say, well, you know, I think it's going to be around about one o'clock or whatever. So, and I mean, I said, okay, you can meet Marty now. And I remember it's the only, the absolute only person, my heart was yeah. absolutely banging I feel against me. a bit my, funny yeah, listening. And really, I was How so funny. nervous. And I was saying to myself, more, I just get a grip, you know. Um, but I really was quite overwhelmed. He's little and he talks really fast, you know, and yeah, great to meet you, yeah. And, uh, and, and, but he was just great. And he's so knowledgeable, you know, yeah. he is just like a yeah. film encyclopedia. Yeah, so of course The Aviator is the story of Howard Hughes, so it's about the film industry. So he's, mm -hmm. it's really his kind of nerdy specialist subject, plus mm -hmm. it's set in the golden era of, of Hollywood. Hollywood. Yeah. So you have that very sort of vintage, classic, beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful makeup on the girls. Yeah as well as obviously all the character makeup. Yeah. So what do you do? You go through it scene by scene and you think how many faces are in the scene, this is how yeah. every face has to yeah. look. You break down the script mm -hmm. for um, numbers of actors, you break down the script and also for continuity mm -hmm. and passage of time, special effects, anything that's going to affect the makeup or, you know, because we will film it out of sequence. Sure. So that's quite a crucial thing is the actual breakdown of the script so that you don't make any mistakes when they cut the film together. So that the scene they're going to shoot in six weeks' time that's going to run straight after the scene you're shooting yeah. today, the makeup has mm -hmm. to be identical. Yeah. So what are you doing there? Face charts? Face charts? Um, well, nowadays, you know, we do, there's really good um, internet makeup apps. You know, there's oh, a really okay. good Makeup Continuity Pro is what I use. Oh, wow. And... Um, it's really, it's all done for you, you know, you take it on your um, phone, you transfer it to your iPad and then you just fill in all this stuff and there's little boxes for special effects and everything. Wow. So it's very, you know, I just use my, now I just use my phone on the set and then at night I link so it up to my So you take iPad. a photograph and it's annotated with things? Yes. Yeah. Take a photograph and then you fill it in on, wow. the, on my iPad in each section. But at the time, you know, at the Aviator, I think. Uh, the Aviator, yeah, it was Polaroids. Mm -hmm. I think it was Polaroids, I can't mm -hmm. remember. Um, no, it wasn't Polaroids, it was digital cameras. But I started out with Polaroids. And then it would be like Polaroid, face chart, and a list of all the products using any kind of little notes. Um, and yeah, then, that's what you, then you have to put a team together. You know, how many people is it going to take to complete the work every day, who's going to do what, how, what's the most efficient way to get everybody on set on time. So, you know, there's a, a limit to how many people you can look after and, um, it, you know, film is money. So right. it's all about how you, you if you say, yeah, so-and-so comes in at seven, seven o'clock, they'll be ready at eight. They have to be ready at eight. Mm -hmm. You can't say, oh, sorry, I'm running a bit late. No, because it. that could be thousands. Because, yes, yeah, so it just yeah. upsets the whole rhythm of things. So there's all that stuff of planning as well, and then big days when you have like 500 extras, 1,000 extras, how do you So how big your, would your team be for that? So if you say had 500 extras mm. at, you know, in a crowd scene or whatever, yeah. how many on your team would you need? For the Aviator, I think there were about, we had about 28 makeup. Wow. And the same for hair, maybe a bit more for hair because of the water waving and everything, uh -huh. and it takes longer. Um, but we had about... 28 and that takes a lot of pressure um preparation and i really love it i i'm very controlling it's like a show it's yeah. like backstage at yeah, a show. it is and i yeah. really like to be quite hands-on right down to the extras and everything because it like sandy said you know it's really important so on a film like that huge mm. production cast of thousands loads and loads of makeup artists you still got your hands in someone's face still yes yeah. yeah, still. you're not just doing kate or whatever you're... no because it's really important and you know um I think it's nice anyway. I think yeah. it's nice to be involved. Yeah. So even, you know, um, on the aviator, for example, I started off, I, I went to the extras tent and I started my day with them at half past four or whatever, five. And then I came to the back to the main makeup truck for the principal actors and carried on with that. Just to make sure that everything was going smoothly and, the, you know, if people had any questions. It was an amazing experience. It was fantastic, great results and everything. And, and then, you know, I did Hugo with Marta, which I was thrilled to do. But even the, uh, the same thing, you know, we had um, 500, I think, 500 extras in the train station every day. And it was 
20s. Um, well, it was 1930s, so it still looked a bit like 20s. So we had an obsession with the lips, really. Mm. And I, would, I would go down and kind of try and do a little, okay, let's do a lip thing today just to nail this. Because, you know, when you, it, it's, it's also, it's a different makeup requirement when you're doing, obviously, number one on the call sheet. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing it, you know, somebody who's a walk on, mm -hmm. you know, crowd. Um, you, you've got maybe 20 minutes, mm -hmm. 15, to, to get that makeup done. And, but I still wanted it to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, and so, do, so does the person, you sure. know, makeup artist involved. But you just have to say, okay, base, what's going to make it look good? Base, brows, lips, you know. And so it's really nice because it's interpreting a period look, what actually nails that period look. So we had big mood boards with big close-ups of all the makeup and... Um, I tried to help out just with products and things that would make it quicker, you know, and colours, so that you're not rummaging around thinking, hmm, what's going to work for this? So it was quite within, um, without being dictatorial and saying you can't use what you want, This there was a palette of, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, it's very to similar it, to a yes. show, isn't it? Yeah. You know, to, say, a Westwood show or something, you know, there's, there's a look and a palette and yeah. everything has to... I mean, it's not quite the same face on everybody, obviously, but, yeah. but, but the overall feel has to be there. When I was looking through um, your filmography, there is a lot of period work yeah. on it. Mm. Um, obviously, Carol, The Aviator, Sense and Sensibility, Orlando, mm. lots and lots of period work. Is that something that you really enjoy in particular? I do enjoy it. And then, you know, because you don't really take a step back and look at yourself. Or think, well, how did how did it work out? When I work with other people, you know, I was working in Montreal last year on a contemporary film, and um, one of the makeup artists on the team said, "But that's what you're famous for, isn't it? Period makeup." And I, I had never really thought about it, but I suppose that's it's true. There is a lot of period makeup mm. that yeah. you've done. Do you ever, like you say about this film in Montreal, do you ever just think, "Oh, I just want to, you know, I just want to put someone in." Every day, normal yeah, makeup absolutely. that I might see in the street. I know. I, I'd love. Yes, I think about that, and I would love to do something really, really um, fashiony. Yeah, or something different. Just yeah, just to change things up, and also to sort of keep your hand in and make your brain work in a different way. Yeah, I would quite like that. So you've mentioned um, Kate quite a lot. That's been a really enduring relationship, yeah. hasn't it? What was your first film together? It was it was called The Man Who Cried, mm -hmm. and it was Sally Potter, the same director who did Orlando, and um, it, it was it was a very ambitious film. Again, it was period. It was set in around World War Two, and it had a great cast: Christina Ricci, um, I love her Kate, face. yeah, Tony Depp, wasn't it? And um, John Turturro. Mm -hmm. Just a few actors, nobody <laughs> special. <laughs> and Kate played a sort of showgirl. So it was it was really nice makeup to do. Yeah, she, and she played an upwardly mobile mm -hmm. showgirl. She she started off, you know, she didn't have much money, but she was going to end up rich. And so she seduces Hooks, this opera singer, and she so her transition in the film was a really nice arc of how she was going to look. Um, you know, her hair was quite um, not as beautifully blonde as it was by the end of the mm -hmm. film and um, her makeup becomes much more elegant and sophisticated. And so the makeup design there was a journey, it was part of the yeah. story. Mm -hmm. It wasn't And that's one of the backup great the things about um, films as well is that you can, and quite often the actor wants you to help them yeah. with what's going on in the narrative and because um, you can help a lot with makeup. So is your relationship, your working relationship with Kate Blanchett quite a collaborative one? Mm. Will you talk quite a lot about what needs to be achieved in the scene and how you might be able to contribute? Yeah, I mean, Kate is brilliant. She's so bright and she's got so many ideas and they're good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and she, she has an idea of how she wants to look. And so that's my job is to try and, you know, obviously bring that together. And I remember even on Elizabeth the Golden Age, that was quite complicated, you know, and a lot of the stuff that was happening to Elizabeth was complicated, complex emotionally. With that, you sort of had to knock back eyebrows, didn't you? And mm -hmm. very, very leaded white yes. skin. Yeah. But, you know, having said that, you know, what was really important to Kate as well was that you saw behind that. So we had right. to have other times when she looked 
she wanted it to look mask like so that you could then see the vulnerability vulnerability of um, being without the makeup being without the wigs so we had a short wig and also the wigs change you know there's a definite arc to the um, the makeup looks as well you know they started off we said okay we'll have quite ornate typically Elizabethan curly mm -hmm. all the little curled wigs with frizzed but as soon as she asked for the or she ordered the execution of Mary Queen of Scots they went really severe mm -hmm. and um, they were quite harsh we got rid of all the little curls and it's quite a you know marked change and so they stayed like that until the end and then even at the end you know um, when she's on the horse talking to the troops um, the costume designer Alex Byrne had this beautiful reference of Joan of Arc mm -hmm. in armour with very long hair and that's how we, we did that because it was a bit like we decided it was the equivalent of a PR moment mm -hmm. and photo op yeah sort of thing. and she she was going to be this icon which it became an icon it must be image. hard with character makeup because because your job is obviously to um, design the makeup look and to a degree design the face but also an incredibly important part of that character is emotion and expression conveyed by the actor's face themselves yeah. from the inside. Mm -hmm. So is that a bit of a balancing act, your bit, but making sure this bit can shine through and, and, and get across what it needs to get across? Yeah, absolutely. Aesthetics, I, mean, I always think, well, how do you do that? Like, how can you get the actor... How can they still act? How can they behind still act? Because yeah. it, it literally is right. a three-dimensional mask. Yeah. I know, that's true. I think, I mean, I think prosthetics have really become very sophisticated. They're not like, they used to look like a hot water bottle in your face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they really did. But um, now they're amazingly fine. I mean, but, uh, you know, I mean, Kate has said to me, you know, makeup's yours, but the face is mine. Yeah. And it is actually that, and it is about knowing when, how much, and less is very often more. Mm. You know, because you have to maintain the makeup all day yeah. in various weathers and might be a lot of crying, it might be a really emotional scene. So you have to be very sensitive to when is the right moment to approach to do your touch-ups. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll think, oh my God, that is going to be ruined. But you don't want to take the actor out of the zone, I suppose. Don't want to take, or even yeah. go in and, and, and sometimes I'll just say, okay, just going to cross my fingers mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, I won't, you know... Um, disrupt the flow of the mm -hmm. work. You have to be very mm, sensitive to what's going on emotionally. And, and also, and that's the other thing about in the morning, five, five o'clock in the morning, there might be some days when it's really difficult or just a very um, centered, grounded morning, not much chat. You know, do I put music on or mm -hmm. don't I put music on? And it's just getting to, to be sensitive to what's happening the day, because the days are really different. Some days are really lighthearted and you know, and actors work differently as well. Some some actors love to have music all the time mm -hmm. and not think about um, the scene while they're in the makeup chair. And some people like to go over the lines and just not say a word. Mm -hmm. So it's just being empathetic. Really. It's quite uh, makeup artistry anyway, regardless of the discipline of makeup you're working in. Is quite. I always think an intimate thing because no other crew member is in someone's face. I mean, that mm. is a very intimate, yeah. sort of slightly mm. emotional thing mm -hmm. because you are staring at one another and you are mm. touching somebody, yeah. whereas an electrician or a carpenter wouldn't be. Mm. So how important is it for you to like your subject, obviously it doesn't matter if it's an extra who's only there for one day or two days or whatever, but a, a principal actor, mm. how important is that rapport in getting the result you want? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question as well. I mean, you know, uh, it's very important. I think you're going to get the best result if you have a really mm. great empathy. But, um, and I always sort of, if it's somebody new that I'm working with, I always think there's got to be something that we have in common, you know? Right. I, there has to be, you know, the fact that we're both alive, we're, we've mm -hmm. already got something in common. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I try and not take anything personally from the, be, you know, the get go, because there's a lot going on, you know, yeah. there's, and there's a lot of pressure on the person in the chair as well as me, but actually it's my job for them to feel comfortable yeah. and to feel... Because yeah. they're coming into your space yeah. and it's your yeah. work, yeah. I, and. You know, and I suppose the pressure is that they feel confident 
Right. And I, th I do think that they probably know right from the beginning if it's going to go well or not. You know, I think you probably feel that, don't you, when somebody touches your face or, or how they go about it. So it's a, it's a, it's a very intimate relationship because it's invasive you're at, you're right it's really you're invading somebody's and personal you're space in a position so how do you navigate like, yeah. that yeah and very much for, you know five o'clock in the morning you don't know what's happened the night before yeah so um somebody might just be tired or you know they might have a child who's been crying all night or they've yeah. been at some they've been out all night at some important event or a party but you just have to sort of deal with that and they have to you know morph into You've like obviously character. developed that 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 close um, creative bond with Kate Blanchett. Who, who else in particular have you found you've collaborated best with? I suppose Tilda Swinton. You've worked with a lot. I worked with Tilda. Um, I haven't worked with her for quite a long. Mm -hmm. you know, at the beginning of my career, mm -hmm. I've worked with her a lot. Um, Bill Murray. You know. I love Bill Murray. Very different. Very different. You know, job requirement. Obviously, is he great. I feel he's, like he he's is great. a god. <laughs> I feel like he's he is great. A, the god that everyone says he's just amazing. Is he funny? Yeah, he's very funny. A lot, a lot of comedians aren't so funny. No, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I go out as a comedy writer. Oh, yeah. do you? Yeah, he's really yeah. unfunny. No, no, he's not. But, uh, but I, he is funny. But I know lots of people in the comedy world, and of course, yeah, and it's awful. Funny, people go up to them and expect to be yeah. entertained yeah. by them, which is yeah. Really because I mean, when I was younger, sort of going off on a tangent now, I did do, um, I did quite a lot of telly things like. Um, Whose line is it anyway? Mm -hmm. and drop the dead donkey and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, so you know, a lot of comedians are very serious, you know, and they're not, you know, making jokes all the time. I feel very happy that Bill Murray's great. I can feel Nat being happy that he Bill Murray's so great. He is so funny. <laughs> Nat's behind the camera, and Nat likes Bill but Murray. But he's, he's funny on just so many levels. I mean, he, he's he likes. He, I think he likes to lift people up, and mm -hmm. he likes to throw people off balance. Yeah. In a good way, you know, yeah. just to to keep everything light and. To be funny, I mean, he's always lifting people up and burling them around. Um, but he's also just very quick, which is, and he's really smart. And, yeah. You know, he's just got brilliant drop dead pan one liners all the time. He's just very, very quick. God, I want but, to ask about everybody. I might have and it's to. A, um, but it's a very different kind of makeup, you know. Yeah. For example, I did that film, um, St. Vincent. Yeah. You know, because people say, well, what makeup do you do for men? You know, but. Mm. It's, you know, you have to make sure it's a 12-week job, 10-week job, so you have to make sure their beard is the same every day or yeah. no stubble or, you yeah. know, I think he had sideburns and a little thumb. You have to be quite forensic about it, don't yeah. you? I think people probably think, well, unless somebody's got, you know, loads of eyeshadow and lovely lips on or whatever, what is there to do? It's mm -hmm. only a man walking... But actually, that forensic nature of it is crucial because yeah. you have to be able to suspend your disbelief as the viewer, don't you, and mm -hmm. not notice. Yeah, Things and that one, you know, he had bruises, so the bruises, yeah. and they had to change, you know, it was part of the story, so I had all these little packets of, you know, bandages on day one, day two, so that they were the same every wow. day, and the bruise changed colour, and so you've got all that stuff as well. It really, you know, has to not look like makeup, I suppose, yes. now. now with HD, which is a makeup artist's kind of nightmare. Well, it is, so, so I remember when... Um, HD first came in, the big thing was um, Friends. So I was a young journalist at the time, so I think, when would it have been? Maybe 20, 18 years ago, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, as a journalist, I started hearing that makeup artists in Hollywood were quite pissed off because the TV was becoming HD mm -hmm. and how unforgiving it was and how you could see the texture of makeup because of course the products hadn't caught up with the technology and everything and airbrushing started to come in and all mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff. How did it, are you now bedded in with it? Are you now just kind of, have you gone through the pain barrier as makeup artists and you know what you're doing with it now and you've pretty mm -hmm. much got it sussed or does it still do your head in? Um, I still don't like it. You know, it's going ahead of your brain. It's seeing more than your eye sees. Yes. And why do you need to see more than your right. eye sees? Yeah. What is, you know, I think it's great for sport. Yeah. End yeah. of story. Yes. That's a really good <laughs> you know, point. Yes. You want to see where the golf ball yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. oh, amazing. For a football match. Yes. Yeah, but you don't HD. need to see every pore. Yeah. But also more, because you're not only seeing every pore, you're kind of seeing more than the eye sees. Yes. So... Why would you want to see that? Yeah. I mean, and it has got better. You know, I think they use um, different lenses now and there are different programs that soften things out. And I think they do 
well, I know they do, a lot of digital correction afterwards. Yeah, beauty work. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that always kind of scares me because, one, you have to trust that they're going to fix something right. in pre- post-production. Um, who's going to fix it? Yeah. Are they going to fix it the way you yeah. would have fixed it had you had, you know, um, different situation? So it's that's quite scary um, because you're not in control of the yeah. end result. And... Uh, you're letting your baby go, aren't you? you yes. You've designed the yeah. whole thing. And, and as a, a, going back to the whole thing, as a technician, it, you know, you want to see it through to the end. If someone Absolutely. says, oh, don't worry about that, we'll, we'll fix, fix it. it. We'll fix it, yeah. I want to be able to fix yeah. it. I want to say, okay, what can I do? You know, yeah. you know, let me see the person in the light. And now it's like very, very quick, and you're looking at monitors, and there isn't the time. But when, when I started work, you know, we didn't even have monitors. Um, I was trained to be behind the camera so that you saw... Peering it. in. Well, yeah, just so that you saw in the direction of the camera mm-hmm. um, angle and also how the light was, you know, affecting the makeup. Um, and now we look at a monitor. So the monitor might not be true. Yeah. The monitor might be over contrasty. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a very different situation and there isn't so much time. But, you know, I think there's a bit of a movement going back to film. Like, Carol yeah. was on film. Yeah. It was on Super 16. And that's one of the reasons it looks so, it looks so beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. And a friend of mine said to me, um, it's about a week ago, but was there some kind of filter? What was it about Carol? And I said, you know what? It was on film. Yeah. And we've, we've become so yes. used to seeing yes. HD that we've forgotten that that's what mm-hmm. all films looked like. Yeah. Only 15 years ago, films still looked yeah. like that. Lots of people have been really... Um, have really loved that look you did on Kate Blanchett for Carol. And and obviously that's mainly about you, but as you say, the other elements like the film and the, the beautiful lighting and obviously her ridiculously lovely face and all of that. But is there any other look that you've done on her or anybody else where you've kind of stood back and gone, got that, that was, I'm really, really happy with that face. That's one of my favorite faces that I've done. Um. Well, I suppose there's a few. I mean, you know, I enjoy doing Kate as... We're talking about Kate. Anyone. Anyone. With Kate start. I mean, I loved... I did a film called Charlotte Grey. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, it was 1940s. And actually, that was a really hard job. I think I did cry every night. Really? Because I was doing the hair as well. And uh-huh. she, she had wigs. And, uh-huh. um, you know, they had to be dressed. And they were period. And it was a, it was a very, very hard shoot. Uh, and I was filled with angst, you <laughs> know. Uh, every day and but I remember seeing it I had to go and see it by myself because I, I found it really hard work um, so I didn't go to the cruise screening and I went to see it on my own at the screening I think I did cry actually but I just I thought you know what it really looks okay it was worth uh, it it was worth it and I, it doesn't I look okay the... it looks really gorgeous <laughs> yeah. I mean that whole film looks yeah, really I thought, gorgeous God, I just worried so much I, I mean but then again I suppose that's what worrying is for yeah like you said yeah. before, it's if you're gonna get if you get complacent complacent about it, there isn't really much point in carrying on. Yeah, there are different kinds of makeup. You know, on Hugo, um, we had Helen, Helen McCrory. Mm-hmm. Who's great I love her face yes. as well. She's, she's she really was actually useful. in Charlotte Grey. I didn't make her up, but she's a really great yeah. person and great actress. And she had to age in uh, Hugo, so she, I think she was supposed to look in her sixties. And I was really, really happy with that because, again, the whole thing about ageing and doing it subtly and believably. Because bad ageing makeup is the pit. Yes. I yes. mean, you, you can't... It's, awful. it's such a distraction. You're no longer absorbed. You're, no, you're taken mm-hmm. out of the film exactly. completely. Yeah. There's, um, there's a scene in one of my favourite films of all time, which is Once Upon a Time in America. There's a yeah. film with Elizabeth McGovern. <laughs> and, I remember it. And yeah. the ageing makeup is so terrible. Mm. Um, that it plucks you out it of the film it, it? that you're yeah. lost in. You're, you, first of all, she's sort of younger than everybody else in it when she's meant to be the same age, so she's not old enough. I remember that, yeah. She's about 25 years too young mm-hmm. in her makeup, but also it's, it's just wrong. The mm-hmm. makeup's really wrong. And that's quite a responsibility for someone like you. More, I did not do that film. <laughs> I'm just saying, using that as an example. That's yeah. quite a responsibility, isn't it? Because you're. People are relying on you to keep people in the moment. Mm. If you distract them with makeup, then yeah. you've taken the magic away. Exactly. Yeah, I think as soon as you are aware of it, yeah, it's not 
working. Yeah, and which was one of the problems of HD, I think, because even now you can see, sadly, you know, on a big screen you get stuff home or Blu-ray. Yeah. And you can see the makeup, and it's, it's very distracting. I always think that one of the hardest things about film makeup must be, like when I'm watching films, and of course I know most people aren't staring at makeup in films, the makeup is there to help them not notice makeup, but obviously I notice it because it's my job and I want to look at it. Um, one of the things I always think must be really hard is to do makeup on an actor where it has to look like they've just done their own makeup. Yeah. <laughs> where it has to look like really they are wearing a bit of makeup but that's what they've just shoved on to go to the office. But it still has to be beautiful and correct for mm -hmm. the camera. I always think that must be really hard. It is very hard. I mean that's hard and also, uh, maybe I said it before, but just making somebody look not good is yeah. very, very hard. Yeah. You know, you really, yeah. you're sort of poised with the brushes. I, I just want to make that not look quite so bad, but you know, you can't. I admire it when it happens though, because so few women are allowed to look a bit crap in films. Yeah. They always have to look mm. so beautiful. So I always really admire actresses who don't mind looking a bit crap and directors who've allowed it to happen yeah. as well, because then you can really get into the story and yeah, see I what think someone's so. feeling. I, I, I absolutely yeah. think so. And it is, it is the difference because it's nothing, you know, it's nothing to do with them as, you know, as you see them no, in their own sure. persona or on a red carpet or in an interview. They're actually inhabiting a character, so yeah, it's being so true to the character. Yeah, if you someone like Jennifer Aniston in Cake or whatever, Jennifer Aniston is always made to look so beautiful and so pretty and everything, even when she's playing a normal girl. She's mm. got, like, perfect cover yeah. of L type face. Mm. On. And in Cake, I was really impressed with that because she really does look rough. Yeah. You know, she looks quite rough all the way through. I don't know who did the makeup, but it mm. was just, she looks like somebody who's in a bit of a bad way who's not made a huge effort. And she went there, and the makeup artist yeah. went there. And it, it's much better, isn't yeah. it? It's much, yeah. And also, you know, you just it's think a well, great performance. you respect it completely. Totally respect because it. I think there is a lot of pressure, though. I think there's a lot of pressure if you are somebody with that kind of profile or any of those actresses. Yeah, oh, she's lost it. She's looking yes, at it. Or, rough. yeah. Um, and maybe perhaps more in, in Hollywood rather than in the UK on that side of the ocean. Um, to always look good. Yeah. It's, you know, it's the age we live in. There's so mm. much coverage and Instagramming and, you know, blogs and everything just with all these pictures and there's just so much pressure to look good. I think I, I can sympathise that it's harder to let go and say... You know, I'm not me. I'm going to play this character, so that's it. I'm actually, I'm not even going to wear any makeup today. I mean, I did a film last year with the gorgeous Amy Adams. Mm -hmm. and I did actually. I remember I got loads of like Charlotte Tilbury makeup. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, oh, this is going to be delicious. Mm -hmm. You know, but the character just, you know, didn't wear any makeup. And really, the character had quite a harrowing adventure, so it wasn't glamorous at all. Mm -hmm. But. She, so how much makeup would go into that not wearing any makeup? How long would that take you? Um, oh, well, that's a good point too. It still takes time because you still go in the morning, you do a little bit of, you know, skin preparation mm -hmm. or whatever. And, you know, I don't want skin to look bad. So sure. I, I still take my time to make this skin look very good. And, and then you would kind of make the, the character look tired or worn out or really pale, or, mm -hmm. you know, if they've had some kind of traumatic experience. So you create a good canvas and then make it yeah. look rough or ill or tired yeah. or on top of the perfect canvas? I, I try to, if it's, yeah, I mean, for skin, yeah, I mean, you don't want to see anything. Remember Like that, having a straight blow dry before you put curls in, kind yes, of thing. that, kind, that of thing. kind of feel. Yeah. Um, also, just remembering that the image could be 70 feet wide, so yeah. you, you do have to, and, you know, you, yeah. we did shoot on HD, so... I want the skin to look good. It's remembering always that it's not going to be that size. It's going to be um, seen on a big scale. And you know, HD, it's like a, it's like a sheet of glass. You know, there's no grain, so yeah. it's, that's why it's not softened. Yeah. Have you ever done a film, and you absolutely don't have to mention any names? I'm just curious about the process. Have you ever done a film where you have fundamentally disagreed with? the director or the cinematographer or, or somebody about how the makeup should be? Or do you just kind of go, well, the client gets what the client wants? Or um, would you stick your heels in and go, I know makeup, I know this is right? I remember, um, I think on Sensibility, uh, I dug my heels in. It wasn't about a beauty thing, it was about a moustache, actually. Mm -hmm. I think 
producer, they really, Alan Rickman, the lovely, lovely Alan Rickman, bless him. I uh, saw that you'd worked with him because you posted on the day yeah. he died. I've yet to hear a thing about Alan Rickman that wasn't just lovely. And, I know, he was yeah. so lovely. But I thought he was quite scary, you know, I hadn't worked with mm-hmm. him before since and since then he had gone that was. And um, I found him quite scary, but he was just so lovely. Mm-hmm. And he had a wicked sense of humour as well, very dry. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the producers really, I think he had done that film, um, the Anthony Minghella film called, with Juliet Stevenson, what was that Truly called? Madly Deep. Truly yeah. Madly Deep, and he had a moustache in that. Mm-hmm. So we did, he was playing Colonel Brandon and I did my research and Colonel Brandon would not have had a moustache. Okay. And we did the makeup tests and they were all like, well, we want him to have a moustache. Because I think, and I just thought, well, there was American Money and I, I felt that they wanted him to have a moustache because Truly Madly Deep had been a success. Right. So they wanted to override right. the protocol, you know, the visual Historical, protocol. Historical, factual, yes. correctness. Yeah, Army yeah. regulation. And I think, I think I did say that I would leave. Did you? I think I, I did. Love I love mean, that. <laughs> I love that I, proper I nerdery, <laughs> makeup nerdery. I'm not Which having I've it. I've lost that object. actually. I you know. wouldn't be allowed to have I the tash. Yeah. I'm going. Yes, I did say no. I can't. I'm sorry. You can't have a moustache. Um, and and they didn't have a moustache. And then in the end, everybody was happy. And you know, but uh, I, th- I think I'm a bit more malleable now. Maybe I've just lost my you know, bottle. Um, well, like you say as well, it's probably the confidence of the young and just thinking I'm yeah. gonna. Dig my feet in. It's know, also, and now I think, you know, you get old, you get softer, you kind of lose your edge as you get older, I think, and I'm more accommodating now. And mm-hmm. I've got different, I suppose you look at things from a lot, a lot of different ways, and I think, well, yeah, yeah. You know, because if someone asked me to do a period film now and said, listen, we're going to do this period film, but we want all the women to look really great, we yeah. want them to look like, you know, I don't know, Rita Ora or something, yeah. right? I would say, okay, great. Yeah. I wouldn't say, but they didn't but they look did like that. You they know, teeth. Yeah. And they'd have really <laughs> exactly. bad skin. Like, and, yeah. Elizabeth the Golden Age, that's a good example. Yeah. Actually, Elizabeth would have been in her 50s, to be factually correct, she would have been in her 50s, she had wooden teeth, she would have had horribly pockmarked skin. I think uh-huh. she was absolutely bald with little tufts. Uh-huh. Um, so, you know... <laughs> that's a, yeah, but, Hellraiser. Yes, but yeah. Shaker, the, Shaker Kapoor, the director, said, no, I, I want my, this Elizabeth to be still beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we did. She mm-hmm. still had, you know, we went for the... You know, she had short hair under the wig or whatever, but she was still a beautiful woman. So, I, wanna, I mean, I could literally talk about this all day. I'm having a bit <laughs> of a nerdgasm here. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about your own face, because we're in your bathroom. 